worsening waves make it impossible to hold their position. The tether becomes a dangerous drag on the ship. Kurt gives the order to haul up Magellan, despite the desire to stay. I just can't believe it. I, I can't, I mean, it's just, it's like unreal, because I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm seeing it, it's there, you know, but it's like, I cannot believe it. It's like, this can't be happening. Is your dream come true? Yes, it's absolutely a dream come true. And what's just amazing is, after a while, you know, you doubt, you doubt yourself so much that you don't know what you're talking about. It was right at the wind corrected location for the radar's positions, just like I said it would be. But sometimes it's hard to believe even yourself because nobody, you never want to think you're that good. And I, nobody's that good. I, only, I even still don't think I am. I guess maybe we got lucky. I could, maybe it was my, my turn to have some good luck. Is a precious commodity. Through hauling up Magellan, the tether is strength. Eight foot swells tear at the cable with tons of force. Then, disaster strikes. All stop, Mark, all stop. The steel reinforced tether jumps the feed wheel and begins to scrape against the crane. Hey, Dave, I gotta get that triple armor onto the bull wheel. Uh, somehow it came up here, it got caught, and it just starts ripping off the layer of armor all the way back on the cable. The strands are what gives it strength, so this is a very dangerous thing right now. I'm, I'm very nervous about this. A mass of tangled wires must be cut away before the tether can be teased back onto the winch. Meanwhile, in heavy seas, 10,000 feet down, Magellan hangs by a frayed thread. This is how you lose these things. This, you know, we got bad weather, but the cable's messed up. I mean, this is a very bad situation. Two hours of emergency surgery. Racing to cut away snarled cables at the risk of weakening the core tether. Then, the worst. Cable snapped. It will. I guess you heard. Yeah. Now what? That's a good question. We'll have to get our fish back, put a new umbilical on, go back and get it. Fourteen years of work and dreams. Two and a half weeks at sea. One Mercury space capsule. One underwater robot. Lost at sea. Three miles deep. Two months have passed. At last, the team is headed back to the waters where Liberty Bell lies. To help the recovery, Kurt has brought in a larger, stronger ship, Ocean Project. This is like in the movie Jaws when Morris Snyder says we need a bigger boat. Okay, we got a bigger boat. With hurricane season on the way, time is against them. I just, I just want to get it done and see the thing on deck and, and uh, make sure it's properly taken care of and it'll, I'm sure it'll be a very, uh, uh, very rewarding experience. Up. Replacing the lost ROV, Magellan called for a crash program. Got your crane on? The crane's on, we're running. No other vehicle that could stand the crushing pressures three miles down was available. Okay, Artie, go ahead and boom up. Boom it up. So a new deep water submersible had to be built. Ocean Discovery. 
We got a telescope in. Usually it takes six months to assemble one of these high-tech robots. Okay, boom it up. Okay, boom it up. Ocean Discovery was put together in six weeks. But the new ROV has never been tested under the torturous conditions it will face at the bottom. Any bugs in the system will be brutally exposed. George, cutting loose. Okay, you're free, Ron. Start driving out on that heading. This is 19 July. During the ROV's four-hour plunge to the bottom, Kurt joins two new members of the crew to study film from the flight of Liberty Bell 7. And Gunter was one of the latter people to be near it on the ground, and I was one of the latter people to be near it in the water. In 1961, Jim Lewis was the helicopter pilot who battled the Atlantic for possession of Liberty Bell. And here we are, 38 years later, rehashing the whole thing. Gunter Wendt was NASA's pad leader, the man in charge of packing Grissom safely into his capsule. And I was 38 at that time. In the early 60s, I mean, Project Mercury was a really, really big deal. I mean, it, you know, it's always been a big deal, but I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the astronauts were like, were like yeah. the new... Uh, Gladiators. I mean, they were like the, every every, know, every every kid was interested in astronauts. Despite his role in the recovery, Jim has never before seen NASA's raw footage of the fight to save the capsule. It's wonderful. I, I it show, it felt so good to see that lift off. I don't know. Five desperate minutes captured on film. Five minutes to change their lives and the destiny of the space race. Sit here and watch this sort of make you think that we're so close. Yeah. <laughs> it does. It looks so very close. Yeah, it comes floating out. But that's, that's the die marker canister. See okay. all the green die? Yeah, yeah okay, back that's the die marker. Line. That came out. See how it's sinking upright? That's why I always figured it would be upright in the bottom, because it went down upright. It seems like a long time here, and it seemed like a long time then. <laughs> to have been yeah. just short of five minutes. But like we said before, all the contingency procedures worked. Everything really did work that day, except the hatch. We got everything back that we needed that was really important. And uh, that was a success in its own right. There's no picture of the hatch blowing open. But if Kurt recovers the capsule, he will bring back its pilot observation camera and perhaps film that will solve the mystery behind the hatch. The loss of Liberty Bell cast a shadow over the rest of Grissom's career. The press dubbed him the hard luck astronaut. For Gus and others, the incident would never find a satisfactory explanation. I was just laying there minding my own business and then pow! The hatch went, I looked up and I saw nothing but blue sky and water starting to come in over the sill. So I popped my helmet off and the only two moves I remember making was popping my helmet off and grabbing the uh, instrument panel and pulling myself out. I only remember grabbing the instrument panel. I don't even remember going out the door. He was convinced there was some malfunction. Unfortunately, we couldn't prove that. No matter what we did, no, when we ran literally hundreds of tests post-flight on other spacecraft and on the system, and we couldn't make it happen. We couldn't make it malfunction. The hatch was sealed by 70 titanium bolts seated in an explosive gasket. A push-button plunger near the astronaut's elbow detonated the charge. Some think that in the cramped mercury capsule, Grissom might have hit the plunger accidentally without ever knowing it. But every other astronaut's experience with the hatch would only back up Grissom's testimony. Every time the astronaut hit that damn plunger, he got a, a, a wound on his wrist. Gus did not have a wound on his wrist. The recoil of that plunger cut through the glove of my spacesuit and cut into my hand. 
when Gus came aboard the carrier after my recovery, he'd been in Hawaii, I think, he had the biggest smile on his face when I showed him this cut hand because there was not a mark on his body after his problem with his hatch. So he couldn't have hit it with an elbow or a leg or something. He would have had a terrible bruise. I said, Gus, look at my hand. It really got hurt. <laughs> he knew exactly what I was telling him. Some people are concerned about getting the hatch and proving uh, one way or another what made it blow. Uh, it isn't important to me. I'm convinced that Gus was not uh, responsible. NASA's extensive inquiry would exonerate Grissom completely. Still, the hatch. Five in Apollo 1.